microdose, yeah. Microdose, 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 dose, dose. What's good, y'all? Kush Hayes here, coming to you, episode number 63 of the Microdose. Usually with me, Robin Seto. Miss Robin, if you're nasty. Unfortunately, she is not here tonight. She's feeling one of the weather. We hope she's feeling better. We will catch up with her post haste. We have a guest tonight, though. Still, the show must go on. And I had the pleasure of going to the Unfound Footage Festival Part 4 fourth year in a row and first movie out of the gate coming out strong we had cranked up presents jillian wallace horvat's i blame society with us tonight is the director writer the star jillian wallace horvat how you doing tonight what's good i'm great i'm great thank you for having me on your show thank you so much for being a part of this tonight this movie is fantastic there's there's a lot of interesting details behind it there's a lot of fun details in it. I want to talk about all that in just a second here. The movie can be found on Amazon uh, for rent, uh, like five bucks. You can purchase it for $13, iTunes, $15. And then everyone else across the board is usually about five bucks on a rental on this. But uh, Jillian, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about the beginning. Where are you from? Well, um, you know, uh, I guess like the beginning, the beginning. <laughs> Um, I, my parents were both journalists in Japan Far that's enough. where they met and I was conceived there. Damn. Um, but then, um, there's a, they don't have many blood types in Japan available in hospitals. It's a pretty homogenous population in terms of blood types. So my mom problem. didn't have a blood type that they had there. So they told her that if she needed a blood transfusion when she gave birth, they wouldn't have her blood. <laughs> and oh. so uh, she went back to where she was from, LA, mm. to give birth to me. So mm -hmm. I was born in LA. Oh, good. So, and then moved back to uh, Japan pretty quickly, but I was just a baby. I don't really remember it. And then um, mm -hmm. my parents split up and I ended up growing up in Virginia mostly. Mm. Uh, then I, I went to college uh, for undergrad at NYU, hmm. and then I moved uh, to L.A. because I actually do have some family here. Hmm. Um, and I, you know, just kind of like it uh, worked at a, a record store and um, went to grad school, which I think is like the normal pattern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went to UCLA and then um, that I got a degree in cinema studies there and that kind of ended up helping me find my path through the, the world of like film scholarship. And so I ended up working on uh, cinema related documentaries and then from there kind of pushing into making my own shorts. And that's, that's how it all happened, I guess. Mm, has cinema always been the goal or just production is the dream to write the greatest American movie. Like what? How did you, how did you get into all this? Like where, where, where was the direction? Um, I think that I'm a disgruntled theater kid. Okay. You know, I, I came to cinema from theater and, cool. and being, uh, you know, writing plays like there's and directing them. There's a lot of reliance on the actor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think with my control issues, that was really hard for me. So the best thing that I could do while, you know, still um, loving the art of narrative and dramatic storytelling mm -hmm. was to get into filmmaking because you have the fundamentals of theater and dramatic storytelling, but you would additionally have the whole grammar of cinema language. Uh, to help you to control and, and, you know, really fine tune a vision that you, I, I think is, is lacking in theater because, you know, you're so reliant on, on spontaneity, on the actor, you know, following through with your direction. And that's, you know, it's compensated for the excitement of liveness, which you only get in theater. But on the other hand, uh, I, I don't think you can be as, as ambitious 
or, or as intimate as you can in filmmaking in some ways. At some point within the movie, uh, which is loosely based on an incident that happened in your life here, there was a movie that you, you were struggling to get made. Uh, in the film itself, it's, it's a movie about Israel. Is, the, is that the same in real life as well? And what is the movie that couldn't get made that led to this? I do have a script that I wrote about Israel, um, but that wasn't the movie in particular that okay. we, that my producers and I were working on and we were having, um, you know, that we were having trouble with, you know, getting uh, myself over the, the bump of belief that needs to exist between financiers and first time directors. And it was just something that we noticed that, you know, there seemed to be you know, a a different standard that was leveled at male filmmakers in terms of taking a chance on them and the level of experience that was, was required from them versus the level of experience that was required from, from female filmmakers, you know, specifically, you know, I was bringing a lot to the table in terms of experience and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, award-winning shorts and uh, already some critical attention and, um, you know, it was a different standard to to guys who who didn't have that level of experience. But, you know, there's kind of a certain myth of the, you know, the male filmmaking genius where, you know, male gatekeepers, you know, kind of see themselves in a young guy and they just it's not they can't do that <laughs> literally with them, with a young woman or, uh, you know, a person who's of a, a different uh, gender identity or sexuality or, or race, you know, there's just not, there's something lacking emotionally. Unfortunately, these decisions, which should be based on, uh, you know, good finance and capitalism, strangely are, are made on gut gut decisions, you know? Dig, dig. At one point, the thing that does trigger the movie is a couple of friends of yours one day nonchalantly said, you'd, you'd probably make a pretty good murderer. What was the conversation that led to that? And then how did you respond? I mean, we were just, you know, um, we were just joking around in a bar, you know, like people say a lot of crazy things, but Mm -hmm. yeah, they did say that I would make a good murderer. And I felt really flattered because it's it's anybody telling you that you'd be good at something is a compliment. And, you Mm. know, uh, I'm a normal human being. I love compliments. So (laughs) Is that where you decided to explore where you could go with that? Like, what was what was the process when when it's time to dust off the script for I Blame Society? Well, I decided to make, I thought that the idea that, you know, of my friends telling me I would make a good murderer would actually make a good short documentary. Mm-hmm. So I started making a short documentary of that, which is the footage that you see in the film that they're watching on the laptop. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was something I shot in 2016 and it was involved in me taking people who knew me my mom and my grandma and my old boyfriend and um, taking them out to various murder locales like the docks and the middle of the woods mm-hmm. and asking them if they thought I would make a good murderer and why mm-hmm. and so I I made that short documentary and I edited it and I I liked it but I didn't really think that it had a lot of substance to it, which maybe I'm holding a, I'm holding the documentary to a, an edifying standard, which maybe it doesn't always need to be at, or I was just feeling insecure, but I put the project aside. Mm -hmm. And then um, I told my, my managers about the, you know, this abandoned project years later, kind of, you know, just like, I don't know, I was being self-deprecating. I was telling them what, like, probably what a maniac I was. Mm-hmm. And um, they really liked the idea of it and they wanted to see it. And they ended up seeing something in it that I didn't, that I think is because I felt too self-conscious, but they saw something in the imagery and in the storyline and they encouraged me to think about it. And so we thought that we could actually, you know, within the found footage genre, take the old documentary footage and incorporate it mm-hmm. and make it this document of, uh, a, you know, it's starting a film that starts off looking like a documentary and then becomes a horror film, a film that starts off with somebody hypothetically talking about what are the characteristics that make a good murderer and then actually starting to kill people. You, uh, you wrote this with your friend Chase Williamson. He's also in the film. 
but at one point chase does die what is what's the process like of talking about murdering your friend with him and him agreeing to being like yeah that would that's that sounds good no 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 no. it, it should be it should totally be like an allergy thing like well, I mean, I, I don't think that Chase at all really thought that I, I wanted to kill him. I think, okay. you know, we wrote this film together and we knew that we were just, um, you know, playing fictional people. Dick. And so, yeah, you know, that came from uh, the outline that I wrote and that, mm-hmm. you know, Chase was really into it. I mean, Chase is a, a wonderful actor, a really great professional. You know, he's the star of John Dies at the End. And he's been in the guest and, and he's, he's a fantastic actor. I think he, he kills uh, a lot of actors love dying on screen. They think it's really fun. So I think, I think he enjoyed it. <laughs> well, did you take any real world situations like at the very beginning and like, well, obviously I'm not going to kill you, but if I did do it, this is how I would do it. And I, I don't know if that was an intentional OJ Simpson quote, but that, that was a whole thing where like he was going to write a book about what if I did do it. And Fox had Fox was going to, have a release a special on it and then mad backlash they just all right well maybe we won't do that but did you have any things like that like yeah i was thinking about the um uh, about the oj book and i was thinking about the the hubris of it i thought that that was really interesting uh, at one point you're you're watching do- or you're watching news footage and they're they're blaming it on a, a white guy only a, only a, a white disturbed male could get away with this and it, it brought me back to like the dc sniper where before we knew it was just a, an African-American father and son team. I don't even remember like necessarily what, what everything behind it was, but like he, he's a genius. He's, he's, he's cold and he's calculated. He he's, he's hunts his victims down randomly. And then it's like, oh, it's a black guy. Or what? Let, let's talk about what the, the Astros did this week. I think that what you said about the DC sniper is interesting. I think that, you know, the media you know, participates in that idea of, of the white male genius. And, you know, that that's the kind of the irony that exists for the character of Jillian, that, you know, people have an idea of what a genius is as a filmmaker, and it has a very specific gender and uh, mm. to it. And it's uh, the same thing with murdering. And that's kind of what pushes her to the breaking point is that she can't get credit anywhere because people are just really loath to believe that, uh, people other than straight white men can create excellence. Is there a director's a cut? Is there a longer edition? Like it's it's a nice tight eighty five minutes. I don't think I don't think there's an ounce of fat on it. Is the best problem to have is like I, there are more details I would like to know. But like is is there another cut that's maybe twenty minutes longer or? No, no, no. The editing went really, really smooth. It that's really, true. you know, we really zipped along, and uh, you know, we didn't really have. Uh, you know, solo budget. We didn't really, you know, shoot too many extra things. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's no, there's no great, <laughs> great moments on the cutting room floor. Um, what you see is, is what you get. Anything written that didn't get filmed? No. Nope. Okay. I got a visible body count of 11. Anybody, are there any caricatures here that are like real world examples for yourself? Like maybe you did overhear a, a guy just like, no health insurance is blah, 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 blah. You're like, this motherfucker. Um, I heard. I heard that moment is more inspired by um, me overhearing what I thought was one of the worst first dates ever with <laughs> a guy. Basically, the vibe was very similar, but he wasn't talking about health insurance. He was actually talking about Chuck Palahniuk, um, oh. but it just doesn't translate quite as well to, you know, do a script. So I wanted to find something a bit more universal. So, um, and I, and I think that people who work in the healthcare industry would, it, I think it would be really difficult to date somebody who worked in that. I would really, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, a lot of people have like a profession that they're like, I don't know if I could date a cop or I don't know if I could date a politician or something. And <laughs> I've had just such terrible experiences in the healthcare industry. I'm sure that some people do go into the job mm-hmm. and, you know, they really do want to help, help people. But I think that, um, or, you know, like this is the thing that's hiring in my town. I don't have a lot of choices, but I still think that, and and I totally, you know, sympathize in that sense. I just think for me, it would be really difficult, especially since I'm like a very passionate advocate of single payer and, uh, you know, it, it just would be hard for me. You, you have a scene with a, with a homeless gentleman 
and uh, you're going over his life story on film and like, where are you from? Why don't you have family? Blah, blah, blah. And you're trying to be very, you're not trying to be condescending, but you're just, you're just trying to get your, your, your film made. And then at one point he reveals that uh, he worked at Boston marketing with you at that, at that point you are officially turned off. And uh, just as someone who worked at Boston market for, for three months in high school, I, I went like, that's fair. That, that whole well, that's fair. because um, my first boyfriend who's in the film, Dave, he did work at Boston market <laughs> and he did not eat the food there. So yes, it, it was, um, it, it, that is totally taken from, from real life. But we still had, you know, a glorious decade long relationship. I find oh, nice. all the people who work at Boston Market I'm, are very dateable. I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> they, they will all be happy to hear that. Where's the straight edge guy come from? He's only in it for like 15 seconds, but I was just like, oh, that's delightful. <laughs> um, you know, I think that came from at the time, like, uh, you know, I'd had some experiences dating people who, who didn't drink. And feeling judged by them, which is, of course, an insecurity on my part and doesn't really exist at all. I think I was being really immature and vindictive by by saying that, you know, in retrospect now, I I definitely respect people who, who don't drink and um, wouldn't mind dating a, a you know, person who, who was straight edge. Um, I think maybe it was also just a good way to get in the Trump joke. But um it's a good joke. Yeah. I thought it landed well. Thank you. No, I definitely respect the straight edge community. Nice. Nice. Mr. Unhoused guy, where does he come from? Well, he's like supposed to be this kind of Renfield character for her. Okay. Um, you know, she she feels guilt over uh over killing the homeless guy, which she needed to do in order to um, you know, to create this uh impenetrable profile mm-hmm. um, that, you know, p- the police could not, um, could not disentangle because she mixes her targets of, you know, the traditionally uh, disenfranchised that are targeted by serial killers, um, like homeless people and, um, you, you know, uh, you know, just people who are on the margins of society, unfortunately. And then she mixes it up with people that she just personally has like a very, immature and vindictive animus against. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so, you know, feeling guilty about killing the first homeless guy, you know, because he actually is really nice and handsome and he listens to her and he's good in bed. She kind of decides to get a second one and keep that one almost like a, he's somewhere between like a pet and a minion for her. And, and she's, and I personally think she like kind of hides his clothes. So he doesn't have them. He can't go oh, anywhere. Gosh. She kind of just keeps him in like his tidy whities you know, I mean, she's a maniac. He doesn't have any lines. The, the most audible thing he does is cry carrying a, a body from your car, but he has the best, it's just the best facial mannerisms. She was like, I bet you're wondering why I'm killing people. And he just, he just like, just gives that polite nod. Like we're just sipping tea. Yes. I would love to know. Love to know more about this subject. He's a wonderful actor. His name is Johnny Mars. Um, Mm -hmm. He uh, was really big in the Austin film scene. He kind of, he works both in Austin and here. And um, if you like his work, uh, he's, he has a lot of excellent credits to his name. And um, one of them, he, both he and the, the guy who gets tied up and stabbed in the back, that's also a brilliant, Austin actor Chris Dubeck who now lives out in LA. So Johnny Mars and Chris Dubeck, they both are in Baccarat. So it's funny, our movies kind of both came out uh, or had their festival debuts in 2020. So, mm-hmm. and both feature two Austin indie stalwarts. How do you decompress after a, a day of filming? Or is it just a day at the office for you? Like that, 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 that Jillian is done. I can take her off like a suit and I'm just back to being me. No, I think that shooting is really stressful okay. and it's, you know, you feel like every day, like your career is on the line, you know, you need to make your pages and you need to make your, you need to make your shot list. And if you don't, then, you know, you are, that's just one more thing that's fucked. And there's so much that you can't control in filmmaking. It's really like juggling objects that are on fire and, and exploding in your face at the same time, even on the most well-run sets. And we had a really well-run set. 
Uh, we had a really great set, but that's life. Life is so unpredictable. So it's hard to decompress. Uh, I think that I just, you know, would watch like a very accessible, charming movie when I get home. And, uh, and that would feel, that would be the best thing. Like I remember in the middle of the shoot watching um, the Steven Sommers version of the mummy for the first time oh. and finding that really soothing and comforting and, you know, just like a great, a great watch and, and also reminding me while I was making the film, I was like, you know, it's important, you know, when you're making a work and you, you know, you want to have, you know, some, thematic resonance to it, you still want it to be a effective piece of entertainment because that's really the pleasure that you give to the audience. And so I was really glad that I watched it to ground me in that feeling of remembering to give the audience pleasure. You know, other shoots where I would decompress, I watched things like Clueless or Blazing Saddles. Hmm. Everyone loves the Blazing Saddles. My sister will appreciate the, the Clueless drop. That's, that's her go-to as well. Clueless was actually a, an influence on the costumes in the film. The um, the scene <laughs> yes. of okay. where she's drinking tea with the unhoused guy. She's mm -hmm. wearing a, a bra and like a kind of a, a Tam of Shanter hat. It was very Clueless inspired. <laughs> that is amazing. How much ad living is going on in the movie? Or is there any? There's some. You know, we, we did it to to hit home the, the documentary feel of it, mm -hmm. you know, even though there's a script to the film and we, we stuck to it a lot. Um, there are elements that we added as well and, you know, invited, you know, the performers to extemporize. So, you know, the end of the first scene where um, she cries, that was not supposed to happen. That, that was an ad lib, okay. um, which I think was really fun. <laughs> The producers, um, some of their, um, that like scene, the, the part where yes, uh, to surreptitiously some filming them under the table and they're oh. just kind of coming up with insults. Um, that was, <laughs> that was just me being like, all right, you know, just let me have it, whatever you think. Mm -hmm. did, did, uh, did the producer also uh, ad lib, I, I got to delete some pictures off my phone? No, I wrote that. Oh, that's, that's a fantastic line. Thank it's, you. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Crying. You, you have a couple scenes where you cry. How hard is it to cry on cue? I was worried about it because I don't have a lot of acting experience, but mm -hmm. I found that, you know, there's a lot of emotions that, that go on, you know, on a film set. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, it's a very high stakes scenario. As I said, I think I was always in a heightened emotional state. So, you know, I tried to, project a aura of total balance and equanimity mm -hmm. but you know it's very you know, it's stressful you know like if you don't get your shot if you don't get the right take like you're in trouble you know and there's nothing you can do about it mm -hmm. so even though I managed the stress I was always feeling stressed so I think that that's um I get that you know, in, when you shoot a comedy, you do want people to feel loose. But mm -hmm. when you shoot drama, like those scenes, it's not a bad thing for emotions to be high. And so, you know, I would just, I would just kind of lean into the fear that I was feeling at those moments. And I would let my, you know, I would let my mind go to a dark place and just feel it. And I had great people around me. You know, um, I, I had great actors to to be with who could really, you know, say the right things and look at me the right way that I really did feel awful because not because they're bad people, but because they're fantastic actors. People like Keith Polson and Lucas Kavner and Chase Williamson. You said uh, the film got a couple uh, film festival uh, screenings. One of them was the uh, International Film Festival of Rotterdam. Did you get to go to Rotterdam for that? I did, because that happened before the shutdowns. That That's happened so in January 2020. So that was our premiere. And it was a real honor to, um, to premiere in competition. We are one of the few American films that premiered in competition and one of the few genre films in the entire festival. So it was uh, that was an unexpected and very very validating feeling. 
it was a, a really great festival and uh, they do really adventurous programming. I went, one of our producers, Michelle Craig went and uh, Olivia, our DP went and uh, they, they were great. Feedback was really good, I imagine. Yeah, it was really, I'm glad that I got to watch the film with an audience. I can't imagine releasing a film and never seeing it with an audience because it was really good, especially with a comedy, to see how it plays. And it was really good to see, you know, the jokes land. And it was really also great to see that moment where you know that your movie is working when everybody gets really quiet and really still. Nobody looks in their bag, nobody coughs, nobody rustles. Mm -hmm. You know, they just, you realize that you've sucked them in and they just want to know what happens next. And that is the, a great feeling after a lot of, a lot of work. Is it the scene where you're in the actress's house with a ski mask and the wine? I think people, I felt people get sucked into that scene. It was, I think it's actually m even more when the homeless guy Okay. It happens. I think that's when people start to, I, I think that scene. Super sympathetic character, of course. Well, yeah, I think that they can't, they just are like, she's not going to, she's not going to kill this guy. No way. You know, she's not going to kill somebody this nice and handsome. I just don't believe she could do it. And she does, but she feels bad. Jillian Wallace, Horvath. We're coming up on the Academy Awards this weekend. Out of 10 possibilities, there are eight. Have you seen any of them? I have. I have. Which ones did you like? You know, the stuff that, um, the movie that I liked the most didn't get nominated for anything this year. And I feel oh. so bummed about that. Which was that? Uh, I'm thinking of ending things. I've not even heard of that. That's the new Charlie Kaufman movie that came out on Netflix. Okay. See, that's the problem with Netflix is they do no advertising. Like maybe you get an email like three days after it's dropped. I delete all those things. Yeah. Netflix needs to do more with their budgeting as far as advertisement goes. Cause they got nothing for me. I did just see the trial of the Chicago seven. It's solid, solid film, but any favorites out of these possible nine or eight, excuse me. Um, I'm just going to say that my favorite movie this year was I'm Thinking of Ending Things. That's fair enough. Yeah. I personally um, recommend I, I, I just I don't it. love the idea of like making films that like, compete against each other. I think that every film does has something that does really, you know, excellently. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, having art compete each against each other when it's so subjective, mm -hmm. it just, I think it's actually totally irrational. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you know, in sports, you know, every there are established rules. Somebody like puts enough, you know, points on the board. They're the winner. Mm -hmm. I don't know how anybody came up with an idea of, you know, obviously this like I'm, I think arts prizes goes back to like, you know, ancient Greece pretty much, you know. But mm -hmm. like I, I still don't think it makes any sense, even though like the people who came up with the concept of logic, you know, mm -hmm. invented arts prizes. Fine. I still don't think it makes sense. Mm, that's fair. You know what? I don't even think this movie is going to win, but sound of metal. If you haven't seen it, I would, I would sincerely recommend it to you. I, it's one of those movies. I want to see it in a theater and I, I really hate this whole time period we're in right now. I think there's a lot of fantastic uh, audio, audio uh, switching going on in that. And, uh, so if, if you walk away with one thing from this episode, I would say, please check out Sound of Metal. It's on all the streaming, or I think it's at least on Prime for free. So that's what I'm going to say on that. Yeah, I did really love the the sound design of that film. I loved the oh, um, the sound design in the last half hour of, you know, um, right. I thought that was really brilliant. Heartbreaking too. I, I mean, thought, um, you know, Riz, Riz is always great. Um when is that I guy really think bad? like his performance in Nightcrawler is not talked about enough. It's yes, I agree. I think that movie's really good. I, I think that um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think uh, you know even people with smaller parts really get their due. Like Bill Paxton is is you know great, mm. and it was just such a wonderful note for him to go out on. Even though um, I, you know, we lost him way too early, and I wish that he had had more opportunities to direct. I love his feature that he directed, Frailty. I think it's brilliant. And um, I wish that he would have 
done more. He was obviously an, an immense talent, especially in, you know, the fact that he could, he picked so many excellent parts. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he, I think sometimes it's hard for actors to look at a part on a page and be like, is this going to be a good movie or is this just going to be a good showcase for me? And I think that his taste was so judicious. It showed what a, a talent as an artist he was. Is frailty the one about the, the flashbacks of the abusive childhood and on, they're on a farm? Uh, yeah, they're like living okay. in, a, in a place in Texas and their dad uh, says that there are demons and that they okay. have to, yes. you know, build a, a hole in the in their backyard to, you know, fight demons. They've been chosen by God. It's been such a long time since I've seen that. For some reason, parts of a simple plan are fusing into this memory. Um but okay. I blame society. Any plans for a sequel? I have an idea for a sequel about Keith's character called I blame myself. Oh, and I've run it past Keith and, and chase and they're both down for it. But um, yeah, maybe we'll revisit it a few years down the road. And then just, just for those now, like Keith's Keith's the boyfriend, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that with the final cut pro seven shirt. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Outstanding. Jillian Wallace Horvat, I think this is a this has been a fantastic conversation. I appreciate you coming in. I, I love the movie. It has a lot of great replay value. I picked it up on iTunes for fifteen dollars. You can rent it for five dollars across the platform. Uh, Prime is available for twelve ninety nine. Do you have anything else you'd like to plug? No, I just um, yeah, it'd be great to yeah watch the movie. I hope you enjoy it, and I'm just super thankful that you asked me onto the podcast and asked me such great questions. I had a really great time. Hey, thank you so much for all this. I hope we can have you back on again, folks. Check me out. I do a bunch of different things here, but I'm only going to plug the cushion Kai microdose episode 100, the final cushion Kai microdose. You may ever hear it won't be the last microdose with Kush and or Kai. I'm just, just trying to make things more streamlined folks. It's a long story. You'll have to check out why that's a whole thing. For Jillian Wallace Horvat, I've been Kush Hayes. You've been you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Micro dose, 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 yeah, micro. from the Bosnet family. And what you see is what you get.